Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Togoff, and in this video, we're going to be talking about something I like to call systematic rotator cuff strengthening. So this is not something you'll find in a journal article. It's not been studied. It's not been validated. And I may not even be the first one that's come up with this. But as far as I know, I've never seen it anywhere. I kind of came up with this method of getting a patient's rotator cuff muscles stronger and progressing in a way that makes sense to getting them back to full function, whether it's work or sports. Generally speaking, in work and sports, what's the most difficult position for people to work in when they've got a rotator cuff issue? It's when the arm is elevated. And of course, there might be some people, it's more cross body or out like this, but for most people, it's doing things when the arm is elevated. When we test rotator cuff strength, where do we do it typically? Well, the standard position is arm right at the side. You got internal rotation here, external rotation here. Let me ask you a question. This standard position for checking internal and external rotation strength, does it tell us everything and is it sufficient? And the answer to both of those is no. It doesn't tell us everything and it's not sufficient. And just strengthening in this position is also not sufficient. Ultimately, we might have a patient who has good strength here for both those muscle groups compared to their unaffected side, but yet when we have them do things overhead, there's still pain and there's still weakness. So I'm going to have eventually another video where we talk about checking rotator strength in other positions like 90 degrees of flexion, 90 degrees of abduction. And we're actually gonna talk about strengthening in those positions. And going from this position to here and then to here and then ultimately getting back to work function, sport function, this is what I've come to call systematic rotator cuff strengthening. And it's sort of a protocol, sort of not a protocol, but I've followed this many times in the clinic and it seems to work really well. Now understand that here we're only talking about the rotator cuff muscles. Of course, in a full plan of care, you're gonna be looking at the scapular muscles, you're gonna be addressing weaknesses in other pertinent muscle groups, motor control deficits, et cetera, et cetera, okay? This is just focusing on the rotator cuff muscles. What I'm about to show you on this slide is a flow chart for how somebody generally progresses through this systematic rotator cuff strengthening. I wanna to get to some slides where I can show you some video clips of exactly how the positions look, how the exercises work, uh, so I won't spend too much time here. So let's get right to it. So the first position, this is the standard position for internal and external rotation. It's the test position for MMTs, for strength. It's how most people strengthen these muscles and it's in some cases where people generally stay. So it's this internal and external rotation by the side. I'm terming this level one. And obviously if the arm's by the side, it's pretty much zero degrees of shoulder flexion, zero degrees of abduction, okay? Now, in my protocol here, so to speak, eventually somebody's gonna to progress to level two. And this is what I call the arm wrestler's position. So now you're gonna strengthen internal and external rotation in a position of 90 degrees of shoulder flexion. And there's two A and two B here. The A here is where you have the arm supported. So it's up on a table and it basically takes away the scapular control that you need. Two B is unsupported and we'll get to those in just a few minutes. So that's the arm wrestler's position. Internal and external rotation at 90 degrees of flexion. That's level two. Eventually we can progress to level three. This is at 90 degrees of abduction. So now you've got those same rotational movements here in this position. And again, 3A, this would be supported on something like a table, and 3B would be unsupported, okay? Once a person demonstrates good strength, hopefully equivalent to their unaffected side in all three of these positions, at some point we would then progress to functional strengthening and return to sport, which I don't really cover here, but we might call that level four. And that would be the ultimate goal of this. Now, all of these positions here for strengthening the rotator cuff muscles, these can be done with any resistance type. They can be done with static isometric. They can be done with dynamic isometric, predictable or random perturbation, so kind of a neuromuscular proprioceptive approach. They can be done with isotonic active range of motion, which wouldn't be resisted, but you can do it with that, or isotonic resisted range of motion. And I'm gonna be showing you the latter here, but understand you can do these positions with any exercise type, okay? Depending on the patient's needs. And this approach 
I've come to call systematic rotator cuff strengthening. And understand that a person, depending on their presentation and how they come in, they can enter at any one of these points. If you have a pretty low level patient with a pretty decent tear that requires some very low level strengthening, they're probably gonna come in at level one. But you might have somebody that's a little bit higher level coming in and maybe they start at level two, okay? And they don't necessarily need that level one. One other thing I wanna mention here is how do you know if there's weakness in any of these positions. Well, obviously in the first position here, level one, that's the standard position, you just do the MMTs. And if you have a handheld dynamometer that gives you exact pound or kilogram values, even better, you know with more precision uh, what the strength is. So how do you know the strength in the other two positions? Well, you do the strength testing in those positions. And I cover that in a separate video. All right, so let's knock the boring stuff out first. This is level one, arm by the side. This would actually be level one internal rotation that I'm performing here. We've all done this at some point, either ourselves, with patients, etc., etc. I've got a rolled towel here or a small pillow between my exercising arm and the ipsilateral side of my torso. Keeps the shoulder joint a little more open, better blood supply. Uh, the muscles work a little bit better when that shoulder's gapped a little bit, okay? And again, this can be used at any point in the treatment where rotator cuff strengthening is appropriate. So if it's a non-operative case, someone comes in, you have to diagnose it as a rotator cuff issue or some other shoulder issue. Again, assuming it's appropriate, you can do it. If you have a rotator cuff post-op repair, again, you're gonna have to wait some significant amount of time until you can do these kind of exercises, but you can ap apply the same kind of logic, the same kind of progression that we're gonna cover here once it's appropriate in a post-op case. Again, here we have level one external rotation, same thing, okay? Just using my opposite arm there for the sake of the setup. Again, rolled towel or small pillow between my exercising arm and the ipsilateral side of my torso. And again, I'll just mention it here. You can do this with any resistance type that we mentioned before, static isometric, dynamic isometric, anything is possible in this position. Now, these level one exercises, these again can be used at any point in the treatment where the strengthening is appropriate. The nice thing about these is they really don't have any flexion or abduction requirements because you don't have to have the arm elevated. So if a person lacks range of motion to get the arm up, that doesn't matter with this. Assuming that it's non-painful or doesn't really increase pain that much or the pain is transient, you can do this. It really doesn't have any uh, elevation range of motion requirements. Now, once a person has good strength in this position and they can get their arm up a little farther, we're then gonna go to level two. So level two, this is the arm wrestler's position. You can see here the shoulder is at 90 degrees of flexion. And under this, we have 2A and we have 2B. 2A is what you see right here. The arm is supported on a table or other sturdy structure. And then we'll look at 2Bs in just a minute. Now, those are gonna be unsupported. So the shoulder's free floating at 90 degrees of flexion. And that's gonna require much more scapular control than when the arm is supported like this, okay? Now, the most obvious thing with this position, level two, is that the person has to have sufficient range of motion to be able to get into this position. And my general requirement is that they need to have flexion active range of motion at least 75% of the full active range of motion. So if, let's say you have a person with frozen shoulder whose shoulder is still frozen and they only have 75 degrees of flexion. Okay, they're not gonna be able to do this because you have to have at least 90 degrees. And again, my recommendation is much more than that, probably around 135, 140 degrees at least um, to start really doing this. If they don't have that, you probably need to be focusing more on getting more range of motion before you start strengthening in these positions, okay? But let's take a look at this one right here. This is 2A internal rotation, okay? So shoulder at 90 degrees of flexion, arm supported, and it's internal rotation. Okay. You can see the anchor point is higher uh, than the surface or really higher than my humerus. And that's going to give a better um, angle of resistance so they get more resistance throughout the range of motion. Okay. So that's 2A internal rotation. We also have 2A external rotation. So for this one, I like to have the anchor point or the resistance point um, about the same level of the humerus or even a little bit lower. Okay. So again, arm is supported, 
Shoulders at about 90 degrees of flexion, but now we're just performing external rotation, okay? Now let's move to 2B. So 2B, now we're unsupported. So this is gonna be 2B internal rotation. So now I'm still in 90 degrees of flexion, but I now have to have scapular control in order, in order to hold the humerus in that position, okay? The tendency for people is as they uh, move the arm down or move it up, uh, the humerus is gonna move out of that position. You wanna focus on really keeping the humerus in that static position, and to do that, it requires scapular control. So this is gonna be a progression of level 2A internal rotation, okay? And then we can move on to 2B external rotation. Again, here, I have the anchor point for the resistance below the level of the humerus. You can do it on the same level, but again, you wanna make sure that that humerus is not moving substantially, staying relatively in the same position. Again, that requires scapular control. Okay? And as with level one, for these level two arm wrestlers position movements, you can do these with any of these resistance types. Okay, Static isometric, dynamic isometric, again, on a broken record saying that. Okay, So that's level two. Then we move on to level three, and we play the same game here. Okay. Now we have the shoulder in about 90 degrees of abduction. We're first gonna look at level 3A, which is where the humerus is supported in that position, okay? Again, another obvious requirement here is that the shoulder has to be at least at 90 degrees of abduction. And again, along the same lines, I want that abduction active range of motion to be at least 75% of the full active range of motion. So again, they gotta be at least at 135, 140 degrees of that to really do this effectively, okay? So the first one we'll look at is level 3A internal rotation. Again, humerus is supported to maintain that 90 degrees of abduction, and then we're just performing internal rotation, okay? We can play the same game with 3A external rotation, okay? Here's 3A external rotation. Again, the humerus is supported here, so those movements the last one and this one are not gonna require much scapular control. Right here, this is 3B internal rotation. Again, the main work that you're gonna have here is really just keeping that humerus static. The tendency is for it to actually move a little bit forward, to translate anteriorly, kind of going into a little bit of horizontal adduction, and it requires scapular control to maintain this position. We can play the same game with level 3B external rotation. Here's that. One thing that can be helpful for patients if you're taking them through these exercises that require the scapular control is to have them do it facing a mirror. Um, there's actually a mirror in front of me over on this side, and I can use that to kind of tell if my humerus is coming too far forward. Again, requires a significant amount of scapular control here. So these B progressions, these unsupported progressions are just that, they're progression, they're harder versions of the supported versions of the exercises. And at any point throughout this rehab process where you're doing these strengthening progressions, you can recheck strength. And of course the goal would be to have sufficient strength and really equivalent strength to their unaffected side in every one of these positions, in 90 degrees of abduction, in 90 degrees of shoulder flexion, and of course in the regular test position, arm by the side. And so generally speaking, when I have my objective measurements, I actually have three internal rotation strength measurements and three external rotation strength measurements. And I track that progress. And once all three are pretty much equivalent to the unaffected side, that's the point where I say, all right, let's start really getting after return to sport, or let's really start getting after return to function, work, whatever it might be. And realistically, as you're going throughout the rehab process for the arm wrestler's position level two and uh, 90 degrees of abduction level three, you might be starting to incorporate a little bit of return to work, a little bit of return to sport type of functions. But once you get that strength equivalent, there's really no need to do this direct rotator cuff strengthening anymore. You can go really just and focus on conditioning, return to work, return to sport, etc. Okay, And that would be level four strengthening. 
So hopefully this video gave you some good ideas for taking a patient through rotator cuff strengthening progressions and ultimately getting them back to work, back to sport, whatever it might be. Thanks for watching this video. Make sure to like this video, subscribe to my channel, and hit that notification button for notifications for all videos in the future. Thank you very much.